I have 115 Canadian national records, or did. One was recently broken, uh, but I have many more. <laughs> and right. a, a, anyway, um, I've done, in, in the two days, the Canadian national record was 221 miles or 355.8 kilometers. Six days was 538 miles, which comes out to uh, 866 kilometers. 1,000 miles, I did it in 13 days, 7 hours, and 3,100 miles, I did it in 50 days, 3 hours. So, and you know, happy to have done that. But to me, the most important thing is the journey rather than just the records. Records come, uh, and they'll go. And I always said with records, that records, you can borrow a record, but you can't own a record, because somebody else will own that record. But, uh, but the journey is yours, you know. And, you have the journey you have. So uh, in Canada, I was born in 1957, which makes me 62. And um, I came from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, Hamilton, and lived there for 18 years, two years in Toronto. And then I moved to New York because I was uh, seeking, um, I was always looking for a teacher, and I was looking for a spiritual teacher. So uh, Sri Chinmoy um, was a guru, and I was interested um, in learning meditation from him. And what year was that? That was in 1977. So I was 20 years And I wanted to be with Sri Chinmoy to learn the art of meditation from the master himself. And it was a great thing that for my life. It worked out really well. Where um, It really gave me the direction in which I needed to go. Um, had you done any running before that? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, in high school, one year, I was running with the track team. And then I entered one race at the end of the year and came dead last, but uh, I didn't mind. It was a two-mile race, which is about a 3K race. And um, I tried to catch the seventh place guy, but I couldn't. Then the funny story is um, the coach told me, okay, I want you, after, after just doing this 3,000 meters, you know, it was about two miles, he said, I want you to do the 1,500. And I, I mean, right afterwards, so I was wasted. I said, okay, why not? So he puts me in, in there. Now, in this, these were all the top people in, I think, in the country. The 420 milers, or, you know, I don't know what in 1500, we used to think the mile. You know, I might have been a, a, a six minute miler, fresh. <laughs> so <laughs> they took off. I was sore as hell. Next thing I knew, they lapped me. When I, I did one lap, they did two. And then they started picking it up, and I, I stepped off the track embarrassed. And the coach asked me, oh, what happened? I said, oh, I feel like I have an injury. Yeah, my ego got the injury. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, it blew my mind. He should have put me in there, but, you know, but, it, was, but it was a start. <laughs> so your running career really mm. started in the worst possible way, really. I mean, it, most yeah. people would just give up right there. Okay, mm. running's not for me. Right. Well, you know, I just, uh, I like running with the track team. So the race wasn't the objective. The, the objective was to run with the other guys and to just do what they're doing. It was fun. You know, so the fun wasn't just the race. The fun was the training. And um, so, but then when I joined the Sri Chinmoy Center, running was part of the philosophy. So it was right up my alley. And, um, you know, it just... He had a 13-mile race, 10-mile races, so I just moved up the ranks. I was, a, I was an okay marathoner. I always said I was an average marathoner, 302, 06, um, above average uh, ultra runner, and then I reached elite status for the multi-days, the longest races in the world. Right. You know, and I guess I have just good stamina and uh, a stubborn mind. When did you make that jump into running marathon? So in high school, you, were, you ran some track. Right. And then, was it after you met Sri Chinmoy? Yeah, it was after I met Sri Chinmoy. Um, yeah, he, he was intrigued by seeing how far you could go. I really loved his philosophy, still do. You know, and it wasn't necessarily about how fast you could, could run, but just how far you could go. And I've always been saying, hey, you know, I could only go so fast. You know, I, like I ran, my fastest 10 mile time was 60. You know, a guy like Al Howie, uh, that we, were talk, we talk about, he was 51, and he was a natural speedster. Mine it was just average, but you know, but I said, let's see how far I can really go, you know, and uh, next thing you know, I tried 24 hour, okay, did 100 miles, and then just kept moving up. I was just, as the opportunities arose, um, I uh, took them, I, you know, I jumped on them. I said, hey, well, why not? People said, why do it? And I said, why not? 
So that sense of camaraderie was was there from the beginning with the track team. The, the idea of just being a part of a group of a team, right? Of being a part of an experience, right? Was paramount for you. Yes, it was. And I just, I mean, running. There's great solitude to it, but there's also a way to connect with others to yourself. So running was for me um, a way to connect to myself and to connect to others. And then um, we you get a common bond. Um, because you have that one um, ambition, one um, thing you're after, you know. So um, running was uh, uh, definitely part of my spiritual life. Was the 1982 your first 24-hour? My f 19 uh, September 26, 27, 1981, I think was my first 24-hour, and I did 102 miles in Ottawa. It was in Greenwich, Connecticut. Well, maybe no. I did one in Ottawa. You are right. Um, I did that the uh, a few months before that, and I Shri Chinmoy told me, "Why don't you just go and experience it?" So he he knew me inside out, you know, and he, he, that's why he was a good teacher for me. And so I went there. Didn't have a great performance, but I didn't care. You know, I got tired. I sat down, but I saw what it was about. So. I like the experience. So it's first tasting, you know, it's like you're tasting something and then you say, wow, that was yummy. And then I just put my face into the pie and, I'm like, <laughs> and ate away, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, first, yeah. let's see what it's about. And I saw what it was about and I liked it, you know. So not always do you have to have a great success your first time. It's just like that race we just talked about. I came dead last, but I said, this is cool. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is, this is where I want to be. And then, then you race some more, and then the more you practice, the more you do your homework, you pass the test, and, you know, you become a success. Did winning ever become important for you? Sure it does, like everyone, but not, it's not the end-all and be-all. You know, you know, I just did a race um, just this weekend. It was in the trails. It was a 72-hour race, and this was hilly. Oh, uh, over the 300k we had 15,000 feet, feet of climb. I was leading that race. All of a sudden my hip flexor, no, I guess it's my hip joint, um, it, it really seized up because I'm not used to the, I'm, I'm a track and road guy, but I do go in the trails when there's trail races to enjoy the, the whole experience. I, I got jammed. I went to sleep, woke up, uh, you know, because I only got an, an hour sleep a night um, for the three nights, you know. I was walking and running. Well, the other ones, these speed, it's a, I was, I'm always the tortoise, and they're, they're the hares. So they're running hard, 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 and I'm walking and running and walking and running. But I do that for a purpose because I know I'm going to be out there a long time. Anyway, to make a long story short, this woman who was leading the race, was in the lead. I finally caught up to her. I was um, in, putting myself in a position to win, and then I went to sleep just for my, my that hour, woke up, I don't know, my, my, my leg kind of, with all my experience, it was my hip joint, you know, it was all got inflamed. And so I lay there for an hour, and I wasn't depressed or anything, but I was, I was surrendered to whatever the experience was. And um, so it all worked out. So the cool thing of this whole experience, um, somebody lent me, my, for all my, these people were very kind to me, lent me these poles. I never used them in a race in my life. You know those running poles? What a beautiful experience. Bottom line is, it wasn't a, I came in second. I did over 300K, which was kind of my goal, I said. Um, I could have won the race. I came in second, first man. But you know, I'd give it up. I, first place doesn't matter so much as that experience that I had. Running poles. What a new, cool thing. Now, i got to use those more often. Now I understand why these guys in the trail runs use these running poles. I'm, I'm hammering up those hills using my quads. Now, now probably, if I would have had the running poles right from the beginning, no problem in the race. So it was a great experience. So to me, it's not necessarily the end result, but the experience of the run, you know. And, and that was a great experience. Glad I had it. I'll take second over first for that experience. So runners who've never done ultra runs, mm. they might think when they hear you say surrendering to the experience, right. that that equates to surrendering to the pain. Is that 
what uh, no, do you I, feel about that? No, I'd never surrender to pain. There's discomfort, and I can disassociate from the discomfort. So I don't, I don't like pain. Like, who likes pain? The, the, well, there's some people who like pain, but I, I'm not in that world. Um, but to me, pain, if it's pure misery, then I'll try to figure a way to get out of the pain. So it's, a lot of times I listen to music. And uh, like this weekend, um, I was listening to Bastille. What a great album they just put out. So I listened to a lot of music. And then what uh, uh, music to me is, is a signal to the brain. Pain is a signal to the brain. We can only handle one signal at a time. So if you tune into the signaling of the music, there is no pain. So even if there was pain, I, dis I disassociate from the pain. And maybe that's why I was a good multi-day runner. I just figured how ways uh, through science, through all sorts of things, to how to disassociate from the discomfort. And, I, I, you know, if there's a little discomfort, so I, I, I approach it as, um, you know, um, it's, it's part of the price you pay for the great experience, you know. For the people that don't know, what's the difference between an ultra race, or what people think of as ultras, okay. and multi-days? Okay. So um, uh, uh, a marathon is 42K, 26.2. Anything over 45K is considered an ultra marathon, ultra marathon. Um, Multi-days are, um, and there's records from 45K. Um, the main statistician, Andy Milroy, says 30 miles, because that's where the first British record is. Um, so he said anything between 42K and 48K is an extended marathon. You know, but the bottom line is 45K is considered the first ultra distance. Um, and then I, I look at things at 30 miles on, because I kind of agree with Andy. Um, Multi-day is exactly what it says, anything more than one day. So ultra marathons go up to about 24 hours. And then when you get 48 hours, that's multi-day. And then there's six day, 1,000 mile, 2,700 mile, whatever it is. And I excelled at the real long stuff um, because um, I, I was able to find ways to cope with my situation there and be happy in it. What's the major differences between running a 24-hour race and a six-day race? Well, there's a huge difference. You can get a great 24-hour runner and they blow up. They blow up in a six-day race. So a 24 hours is uh, a six-day, you've got to have a lot of patience and confidence and, um, you know, People break down. There is a limit for different people. My, I always look at my limit is there is no limit. And, um, you know, once I'll get the experience and I'll try to figure out ways to expand on that. So I might not be the fastest runner in the world, but I was blessed with um, endurance, you know. And, um, you know, I'm able to have fortitude. and I use my spirituality as um, part of, uh, uh, of the experience, you know, to give me the fortitude. Right. And you are going in the dome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I look forward to that, boy. I'm going to have a great crew, and I'm going to have... A, I, I, I am psyched to the guilds. The best in the world are going to be there, and they are going to pull me along. You know, and just... Uh, I have... You know, I, 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 I live for that stuff, you know. Six days in the dome. Six days in the dome. Some people think that's nuts. And I, I, some people say it's crazy, and I'll say it's crazy good. Yeah. Is this the best field you've seen in a six day in a while? In a while, yeah. No, the best, uh, when I was in my prime, that's when the, they called it the golden years. So I went against the best in the world, held my own. Like at the world championships, I was like third in a number of years. And the guys that were ahead of me were clearly better. I bowed to them for their capacities. You know, I saw a guy, Jean Gilles Boussiquet, and I just say, gosh, he's just so much stronger than me. But I accepted it. So, you know, I. I I admired his ability, just, you know, we're all connected, but his ability was just strong. He was just faster, stronger, that's it, you know, and uh, I accept that, you know, but I'm connected to him. Is there a clear favorite this year in the Dome? I think there is, a, I think a, there's a Swede, there's a South African, Johan Steel or Steen, I think it's Johan Steen is the favorite, Joe Fiegers the American who just did 600 miles in six days a number of years ago. Um, you know, there, it was clearly... What about Pete? Pete yeah, there, yeah, yeah, Pete. Pete will be interesting. I saw him in a 24-hour, and he faltered. But if, he, if he's on his game, if he's... I hope he is. I want to see... 
I don't want to beat them. I want to watch these guys. I want to be a running spectator and do their very best and be part of that part of history, you know, and just see them do their thing, you know. Right. I'm, I came and I went, but now I just, uh, my heyday is long gone, but I still am doing it. And uh, I'm happy to participate with the world's best, you know, and just uh, watch them do their thing, you know. And out of... Uh, um, do you have a goal, mileage? Oh, yeah, 400 miles. It used to be 500, now 400 miles, absolutely. Maybe 75 the first day, 65 after that, you know. And I, 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 I'm pretty scientific that way. I know what I want to get, and, I'll, and I will get them. I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty determined, you know. Um, unless something blows up, then I'll just try to figure out, okay, this isn't working, let's go to plan B, you know. Right. Like a lot of runners, you know. If I can't get it, I'll try, 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 um, but if I can't pull it off, I, I put a, a second plan into to, uh, effect and just, but and then again, I, I, I'm not thinking just 400 miles. I want to be where the world's best are. And so I can compare myself to what they did and watch them do what they do best. What was your first impression of Al Howie when you okay. met him? Al Howie, I loved Al Howie. I had great experiences with Al Howie. Um, he was a Scotsman that lived in Canada, um, and he, he, I met him in 1981. And Al Howie was, um, he drank a lot of beer, so, <laughs> but I don't think it's a good idea. Not all things Al Howie did I agree with. I drink water, he drank beer, and he was, first thing he said to me, I think, he was telling me how great Molson beer was, you know, and I said, oh, really? And I said, Molson's are the bats, and he, I think he was a Molson's man, but then, <laughs> anyway, Al, Al Howie was a nice guy, he was a real nice guy, very warm, um, some people might not think that, or some might think that, but I, I thought Al Howie was uh, very nice, and I remember, um, Going to Canada, I think it was the, um, the, the second time I went to the Ottawa, and the last time I went to the Ottawa, 24 hour. I did like 104 miles. He, he won the race with 150. My friend Arpon D'Angelo did 120. We're all sitting in the hot tub. And my, the thing I remember is the hot tub, not, the, not so much the race. But I remember Al Howie in that first race, broke three hours for the marathon. I think it went out a little too hard, you know. But he, he had a, a competitive nature. Like, you know, he had to win. He had to be the best in the world. And that's nice. But, you know, it's not how I look at things. But So he had it even then? Oh, yeah, he had the drive. Absolutely. He was there to win. And at all costs, you know. I'm going to take it out hard. I'm out, out there to beat you, you know. But I looked beyond all that. And I saw the, the nice gentleman that he was. You said once that, that you've run the 3,100 three times, right? Correct. And you told me that you thought the 1300 with the 18 day cutoff was maybe the most difficult multi day. Absolutely, without question. No, hands down. Uh, to do 72 miles a day for 18 days um, is remarkable because you can't falter. The only guys that can really pull it off are about 230 marathoners. Uh, then they can falter a little bit, then they have this raw speed to take it back in. Al Howie had raw speed. He was a 228 marathoner. So um, Al had great ability. What I loved about Al Howie was he wasn't just fast and, and moved fast. When he wanted to, he sh could slow it down and go for hours and hours, five miles an hour. And he was content with it. And we became, uh, uh, he was just playing with the field. Man, he just it was like, I remember saying to somebody, he said, he just makes it look so easy. Al made it really look easy. You know, at least as far as I could see, whether it was for him or not, only Al would really know, you know, or he would, would have known. Um, but Al, Al definitely, he was one of a kind, really was. I loved him for just who he was, you know. And there's so many funny stories out of Al Howie. I just remember, he would talk to me, he had this thick um, uh, Scottish broke kind of, Talk. So he's talking to me in one ear. Now there's other Asian guy named Ronnie Wong. Um, he has a thick Asian accent, you know, and he's talking in my other ear. And they're both talking at the same time. Couldn't understand the word they said. And so I just put on my music. 
we all ran together, and, uh, and it didn't matter to me. It was all the energy of the whole experience. And they were happy talking my ear off. One was talking one ear off. The other one was talking the other ear off. So instead of having them all t talked off, I just put it in my music to save my ears, you know? <laughs> so that was... Uh, but Al, Al, Al Howie, I just have fond memories. I have nothing... Somebody said, say something negative about Al Howie. I couldn't say one thing because I don't know. I never had that experience. Great athlete and great, uh, um, he, he was a good guy. So you knew him from 82 in the Ottawa. 81. And then when you saw him again, when he came to New York finally in yeah. 89 right. to run the impossibility, had he changed? Had he changed? Same old Al Howie as far as I could see. Um, what I could remember. I mean, Al, Al just came off that run. I, I was so impressed that after doing, and I'm one, I'm one of the few guys that really could understand Al Howie because I've m kind of matched his stuff. Or, and uh, like, for example, I did 3,100 miles. I averaged 99K a day. Well, he averaged about 100, 101K a day for 5,000 miles. So I kind of have an idea what, what it takes to do that or, um, you know, um, Say so he's, he's done 200 miles in route to, in a 1300. I've done 221 miles for two days. So I kind of was on his level. Um, El Howie was, um, you know, he what was so impressive was he just did 5,000 miles at 100k a day across Canada. Then all of a sudden he came down and he shattered that world record for 1300. The hardest race in the world that I... Two weeks later. Two weeks later. To me, that was an incredible accomplishment. He wasn't wiped out. You know, he, he really wasn't wiped out um, physically. And, you know, it's like... But the only thing I noticed, a funny thing about Al Howie, uh, I remember running in the 1300, he was a skinny guy. And so, as he burns the calories, and, and he, he did all that running, so he got thin as it was. We thought, he and he ate, I guess... Maybe he was li li living off, you know, the energy of the sun or something. I don't know. Plug in Al Howie. <laughs> you know, he's like, plug him in, and uh, he didn't eat food. He just ate uh, electricity. Um, but with Al Howie, um, he got thinner and thinner. We all thought at the end of the race he would just be this phantom ghost. I swear to God, we're talking about it. He's getting thinner and thinner. And he's getting, you know, maybe he's getting lighter. We were all kind of amused, some of the runners, and saying, maybe he's going to disappear. Maybe they should have made it, uh, um, you know, uh, 2,600 miles. He would have just disappeared. <laughs> well, what happened to Al Howie? He just kind of evaporated. <laughs> well, you, you did see another side, uh, 94, 95, 96, where he was vomiting, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Al was a great runner, and he worked on um, the physical running but he didn't have a clue about diet. What made me, I'm going to be very honest, what made me, with the help of my wife, is um, uh, we, we really focus on diet. That's why I'm still here and alive and well after 40 years of ultra running. And like my goal is to do it, the world record for longevity. That fascinates me. Not necessarily for the record, but just to do it for 60 years. I still got another 20 years, look forward to it, but I have a good diet, you know. Do I look undernourished? No. Hello? I'm not undernourished. <laughs> so, um, but, but Al, I don't think, had a good diet. I mean, I'm drinking water, purified water, alkalized water. What's he drinking? Molson's beer, you know? Give him a, give him a Tim Horton donut and, and, and a Molson beer. For These are for the Canadians, you know, and he's happy, you know. But uh, give me whole food, plant-based food. That's yeah. a good question. About. I come the, from the days of cotton shirts. Now they have the uh, um, dry wick stuff. Much better. I always like cushioned shoes. Hoka's are fantastic. So we had the Nike waffle trainers. And now they have these Hoka's. You know, they're like pillows. Fantastic. Technology's great. Um, and um, uh, socks. Cotton socks, nylon socks. Back in the 80s. You know, now the Drymax socks, you know, wick away all the sweat. It works, and it's important, and, and uh, I think technology is fantastic. Or just 
you know, you can be in touch with a race. You watch, a, you could be 2,000 miles away and watch a world record being done in, in uh, like a Camille Heron when she did her 24 hour and watch all her splits and she's a great runner and seeing how she does it, you know, and watching her do it, you know, so there's no, no speculation of do they really do it, you know. Back in my day, sometimes people could make claims. Now you can't make claims anymore, you know, you know. You do it in a race and it's watched. Now in our days, we, had to, we have the integrity and so we kept the, you know, it's, we're honest as day, at least my group. Um, but you know, every so often you can get somebody who said, oh, I did a record, you know. Now everything's legitimate and fantastic, you know, and um, yeah. Recovery is much easier now, right, too, as well, uh, compression oh, boots, compression socks. Oh yeah, those, I tried, um, like I told you, the poles, trekking poles. And here I could have won a race, all treated any day learning about these trekking poles, right? And I tried the like for example, going up with those trekking poles, yeah, I just flew up the hill. And like cross country skiers. Before I was like, You might have a new career now with yeah, these poles. Yeah, pole man. <laughs> and uh, but also um, the, the, I'm a massage therapist and then when I went down to a fifty K in Pennsylvania I tried those compression uh, um, thing. Oh, after I felt great. I said, "What? What have I been missing?" You know, it's like these things have been there, and you know, I said, "Oh, who needs them?" I said, "No, I tried that." I said, "I need them." <laughs> and there were no gels. And you no, yeah, right. yeah. I'm not big on the gels. I'm kind of. It's it's better than what was. We used to have like Drake's ERG, you know, uh, um, which was an electric like replacement. Now there's much more variety of stuff. So. Um, but then I, I like homemade type of uh, um, concoctions, better for me, you know, and I think I can't market it, but they're probably much better than what's out there. Thank God for my wife. <laughs> right, yeah. right, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, Bob Weiss would have liked the polls? Maybe he would Oh, he was hilarious. Bob, Maybe he would have liked the polls? Well, here's a Bob Weiss story. Would he like, no, he was an old fashioned type of dude. He was, he was a sweet man, army guy, he was, but, but he had problems with his neck or his back. And, he, and so what, in the very first thousand mile race, you know, the Sri Chamoy team tried to help him out. You know, the, you know we wanted finishers. I wanted finishers, because that was my idea. And we, tr we thought of things to help him. So they put a toilet uh, roll, you know, to toilet paper under, instead of leaning like this, they put it there to prop it up. So here's this guy going around in the zoo. <laughs> they say probably thought, he, did he escape from one of the cages there? And they had gaffers tape. The track was yeah, right, right by the zoo. Yeah. yeah. And they, they put gaffers tape around here, you know, or, or that, you know, the gray tape. Is it gaffers or? or like duct tape? Uh, duct tape. So he had duct tape with a toilet roll here. And then, you know, it, because he kept walking into trees because he could only lean forward. And he walked us in a tree, and then he said, oh, excuse me, and, you know, it's like, he was like a real southern gentleman, you know. You know, he, he apologized to everyone, you know. He, he had southern charm. I heard he apologized to the trees. Oh, yeah, every them. tree. <laughs> you know, we have all kinds of people in our sport. People think we're crazy, but I always say crazy good. Peter Hodson, the alien warrior? Oh, yeah, Peter Hobson. That's another guy, like Al Howe. I couldn't understand a word he said. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> so he, he was speaking alien. I, maybe he really was an alien. You know? <laughs> I, I couldn't understand. But he and, could put up some miles as well. Oh, yeah, well. sure. You know, he would run, but he was always talked about biking. And unfortunately, I think, he, he didn't he have a, got killed with a bike or, or he was paralyzed or something? No, I know Eve's pole fell off of a roof. Yeah, yeah, Eve's pole. But Peter Hobson, I believe he got in a biking accident and also was paralyzed or something. Something, a tragic ending. I was very sad to hear that. But I remember, all my stuff is in good humor, you know. He talked to you and I said, yes, sure, great, wonderful. And, and in my mind, what does he, what did he say? What, 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 what? <laughs> And Emil, of course. Oh, Emil, Emil, very interesting character. Oh, man. Emil Laharag, very good runner. He was the adventurer. He was an adventurer. You know, he came back from one race and his tree shot, I have something to show you. 
in his French accent, and you know he uh, he had these. He showed me these darts. He said, "You see these darts? They're from." He was trying to psych me out. Now I'm just thinking, <laughs> I'm going to use these dart on you. But you know, in the middle of the race, come here, come here. So I was, I was changing or something. See these darts? This was used to kill people in the Amazon. And he had one of these blow things there. We would go, <laughs> and the dart, and it has poison tips, and they would kill. And then, then you see this, and he brought a shrunken head. And the shrunken, and so he says, this is what they become. And then, you know, so I just took it all in jest. Now, now I think of it. Was he trying to use that to say, Do, don't mess with the meal, you know? Who knows? But, you know, thank God I'm not, not the smartest man in the world. <laughs> but he put up some miles, too. Oh, that, sure. In that yeah, first yeah. thousand mile, he came in third oh, right behind yes. you. Oh, yes. And Choi. Yeah, yes, yeah. Emil Laharag, the trouble was he got these deep blisters, and he was asking, give me Novocaine, inject it into the, into the blister. I don't want to feel the blister. So he kind of, he wanted performance, like all of us. We all want performance. We all want to achieve. He wanted to achieve too. But um, he was, uh, um, yeah, he was tough as nails. You don't mess with him. Um, and I have fond memories of Emil because we, I would be at a race in one country, he would be there. And he was a good luck charm to me. I remember when I ran my best six day in, indoors at La Rochelle, he was there. When Sydney to Melbourne on Australia, he was there. Sri Chamoy Thousand Miler in New York, he was there. And only time he ever came ahead of me was one race, and that was in the desert.